Welcome to the Consciousness Anywhere and Everywhere podcast. I am Shannon O'Hara and I invite you to a completely new world of possibilities. Hello, everybody. Some of you guys who may know me know that I'm very diversified. Some of you guys that don't know me personally probably wouldn't know this, but today I am so excited for my guest, who is Michael Rossmer, who is the founder creator of something called Offshore Citizen. Now, my path crossed with Michael's because I had a little bit of a EU citizenship issue after Brexit. I hold a British passport. Um, Many of you guys may or may not know or even care, but essentially Britain left the EU, meaning all British citizens no longer had a right to domicile or had freedom of movement in the EU. And I needed to do something about that. So this is when my path crossed with Michael. And so, Michael, do you want to say a little bit about what you do? And then I want to ask you a ton of questions about how you got into it. Sure. Sounds great. Well, good to, good to be here. So, I mean, very simply, I think that what I do is I help people to live and do business around the world. I guess that's kind of the, the simplest and to do that in an optimized way. So a lot of people, uh, they might try and do that. They can, what I always say is like going to another part of the world, doing business in another part of the world, setting up companies in another part of the world, banking in another part of the world can either be way more hassle or it can potentially give you lots of advantages. And so I basically help people to make sure it's the opposite. And so we help people to get residency per, or residency permits in different places, get citizenships. We help them to form companies abroad and optimize their international tax and do international banking and all these kinds of things. Which is all stuff that I have done in my own life and something that I've been pretty much doing for the last 10 years. Uh, most of my listeners probably wouldn't know this. And this isn't something that I tend to announce because it freaks most people out. Um, but I was a U.S. citizen and I'm now an ex-U.S. citizen. So it's all part of what, and I've, and, and um, also guys, just so that you know, I'll put all of Michael's links and resources in the show notes for this. So if you guys want to check out what he does, like do, you make awesome YouTube videos. In fact, that's how I found you was on YouTube. Awesome. Thank you. I'm glad that, uh, glad that people enjoy it. So, okay. I'm dying to know, how did you get into this? Um, you know, so I think the background for me really started with trying to do stuff myself. So years ago, this was like I don't know, 15 years ago or something. I was trying to do some stuff where we were raising capital in Canada and investing in property in the U S and I was trying to figure out how to do that for us. So I would call lawyers and accountants in the U S I would say, Hey, here's what we're trying to do. What should we do? And then say, I'll do this. And I'd be like, Oh, but I'm from Canada. And they'd say, Oh, then we can't advise you. And then I'd call people in Canada and I would say, Hey, what should I do? And they do this. And I'd say, but we're investing in the U S and be like, Oh, then we can't advise you. Mm. And this was super frustrating. So we had to figure out a bunch of stuff. And around that time, another friend was quite interested. He had seen, Articles on the front of the Wall Street Journal or whatever saying, you know, GE makes 800 million in profits and hit, and like it's a tax credit. And we like, how does this work? Like, what's going on here? And he started writing to various accountants and lawyers, and they said a bunch of them would write back and say, "Oh, it's illegal." He's like, "Fine, this is a Fortune 500 company on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Like, this is not illegal." Right. Uh, right. And uh, so then he found some who turned out to be like really really brilliant legal minds and they could explain it. And they happened to say, Hey, if you wanted to go into this business, we would mentor you and we would do the legal work to back you up. And so um, then he contacted me and said, Hey, what do I have to do to get you to come and do this with me? And I had just finished off in another one of my businesses and was kind of somewhat flexible on what to do. And so I said, oh, I'd give it a try. And it turned out that there was a bunch of things that worked quite well in terms of the way that I thought already in some of my previous experience. And so I ended up getting mentored by some really amazing lawyers and, uh, you know, kind of heading down that way. And then it just gradually kind of evolved, right? I went and I lived for three winters in Costa Rica and, you know, met all kinds of different people. And you gradually 
as you meet new people, they have kind of new needs. And so you try and help them and you just kind of expand your knowledge until, you know, you're pretty, pretty well around. So since then I've lived in all different countries and traveled all over the world and met all kinds of cool people and built all sorts of network of resources. And it's great. Yeah. I like the way you state that it sort of like, like kind of matched the way your head and your mind already worked, which I think is a really astute distinction because most <laughs> people would just be completely like stunned by the magnitude of dealing with international ramifications. I know in my own personal experience, I was just like, uh, okay, well, <laughs> I know I need to, I know I need to do something, but I have like no idea what direction to go in. And that's why people like you, I think are so brilliant because you're thinking beyond borders. You're really looking at the global possibility rather than the national restriction. Um, yeah. Which is something I'm a huge believer in, especially in this day and age. It is tremendous what you can get access to if you just start looking outside of your country. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And like, you know, it's really interesting because I think a lot of people, the way that they approach things is they kind of hit a roadblock and that's it, as opposed to being resourceful about the problem solving and saying, okay, well, that's not good enough for me. So, you know, what's the way around that? You know, what's the way to, Kind of think three dimensionally about this, and maybe see it in a different way, which allows you to have a different outcome, a different result. I love that to think uh, like, how do I? What's another way? I mean, that's a brilliant question because I mean, in truth, there's like literally always another way. But it's of course for people who desire something different. Oh, mm-hmm. I actually want to ask you about something. A tweet you actually recently did. This is kind of a juicy one and something I'm really interested in. My husband brought this to my attention. I don't I don't even uh, use Twitter. Like I have no idea how to use Twitter. He's like, hey, did you did you see that tweet from Michael? I was like, no. So he he sent it to me. He said, I'm very interested. Uh, you said I'm very interested in reinventing money and consequently the monetary system because I believe the nature of money is a huge drive of corruption and a system that keeps many in poverty by preventing them from um, activating resources. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is a huge statement and something I 100% agree with you on. Can we dive mm-hmm. into this a little bit more? Sure, yeah. What do you, what do you want to unpack about it? Because there's actually quite a bit in that statement. Oh, yes, there is. So... Let's talk about reinventing money. So what do you mean by that? Well, so the way that we do the monetary system uh, is that money is a monopoly. There's a monopoly issuer of money, which is a government. Okay, there's like a few monopoly issuers of money. But within any given country, they have you know their form of legal tender. And money is actually a system of coercion. A lot of people don't really know this, but it's basically enforced by the government's uh, requirement of you to pay tax and their ability to enforce that with violence. And mm-hmm. that's basically the, where the value of that money is derived from. Some people will say, oh, you know, money is valueless. You know, it's, has, it's just paper. It's like monopoly money. It's not entirely true. What happens is that the money cre- it has value because the government pays people in it. And then they turn around and they say, hey, we're going to require that you t- pay taxes in that currency. And if you don't pay that tax, we're threatening you with violence. And so there's actually a real value because it's basically like an extortion play. You know, it's basically a protection scheme. And that to me is a really bad starting point. It gets worse when you kind of the whole thing about uh, uh, about the corruption part. If you consider that some centralized body of people have the ability to create money out of nothing with zero personal consequences, there's no personal accountability Mm. attached to this. And the moment that you have the ability to spend money without consequences, your incentive naturally is not to spend that in a way that is good for the like populace, for the market, et cetera. It's to take advantage of that, right? You start saying, hey, well, what's my incentive is to get basically reelected. So what am I going to do? I'm going to create money in order to get reelected. And I'm going to effectively, in a subtle way that is not super visible, transfer wealth from some people to another people. Yeah. And then the next consequence of that is you get lobbyists who realize, hey, these guys can print a whole bunch of money. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go and we're going to lobby them to, hey, we'll support you and trade for you giving us money in a way that is not really productive. And that creates really bad incentives within the system. It basically encourages rent seeking. I don't know if you've ever read something like Atlas Shrugged, but 
essentially this is like a giant group of looters is really what you've got going on. And the incentivization for more people to become looters because it's more profitable to stand between the faucet controlled by some government people or central bankers or whatever, and the end place can just take your share as opposed to like really producing value in the world. So, you know, yeah. that's real bad. Yeah, yeah. And the I love the statement of reinventing money because that's something I'm extremely passionate about. I I remember when I got my first tax bill and it was like well into my 20s because I really wasn't making any money until I was like late into my 20s. And I got my first tax bill and I was like, wait, this is weird. And then it took me, <laughs> that was my response. This is weird. And then it took me uh, 10 years of really, really struggling in America. Like the more it was just, and I went, I got to, there's got to be another way. And I, that was the first question. There's got to be another way. Like everyone around me was just doing it. And I was like, I can't. And I, and I tried to make myself be okay with it. And I tried to, I was like, well, everyone else thinks is okay. Why can't I just like relax and like get into this? And I tried to hire expensive accountants and comply and do this and do that and learn and educate. No matter what I did, it was just, I was, Every time I had to deal with taxes, I like wanted to kill myself. And I was like, I can't live yep. like this. This is not working for me. So I was like, what else is possible? And yep. and this is one, I have a really good friend of mine who completely I attribute to change in the direction of my life. And I was talking to him. His dad is a self-made billionaire. And wow, um, nice. yeah, from Scotland, came from nothing, like totally nothing and just built him, built everything. And so anyways, I'm really good friends with his son and I'm talking to my friends and I'm like, what do I do? And he goes, stop being American. And I was like, kidding, <laughs> right. He just, I thought he was joking. And he was like, well, that's, and then <laughs> that was the first seed. And I went, Oh, that's how I can deal with this. And so then I educated myself and it didn't, it took me years to get around to it, but I was like, Oh, that's right. That's a possibility that there is a choice. Yeah. 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 So when, when you talk about, do you actually have, so what are your sort of ideas about reinventing money? Well, I mean, I have quite a contrarian view of money that I don't think anybody else probably has. Uh, so I guess to understand my ideas about it, which, so I think there's different sides of it. One is, you know, what's the technology that you do. And I think that uh, blockchain technology has enabled uh, something. But uh, I think that if you understand like how the system of money probably should work, yeah, it's worth, ooh, it's worth understanding. Oh, what do you mean probably? Uh, probably, uh, probably the technology. You mean? Well, you said if you understand how money probably should work, do you mean ideally? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, ah. Yeah. Okay. So what? Yeah. How? How should money probably work? What? What could money be idealistically? Well, Okay, well, uh, let's start it, to understand why it is. If I just tell you, people are going to be like, "Oh, that's a ridiculous idea." Um, not so by, not necessarily, to... not necessarily my listeners. They're pretty. They're okay. Pretty, yeah. Cool. I think well, they're interested. Well, let's let's pull back to just like understanding kind of where like base money. I don't know, base money is the wrong term. So people can confuse it with something else. Where money originally was, like, what, what was money originally? Because I think the people's narrative on this is wrong. Um, so if you just imagine you're a really small community, right? Let's say there's 100 people at a little farming village back in whenever, right? And people need to exchange goods. So they say, hey, listen, Shannon, you know, you've got chickens, so hence you've got eggs. I'm a farmer. I'm producing crops. You know, I'd love to get some eggs, you know, but I don't. And so, you know, what do I have to trade you? And you say, well, hey, listen, you know, I'd like to have some crops. But, you know, it's not harvest season yet. So, you know, can't do that. And you say, well, let's just make an agreement that in the future, when the harvest season comes, I'm going to give you some crops uh, and you'll give me the eggs now. And so we say, sure, you know, we can do that. And we write up the note. And if you think about it, money is allowing you to carry value forward through time. This is kind of like mm. the first, first thing. Um, because if you could exchange right now real goods and services, you wouldn't really need uh, anything. So we create this record and it actually doesn't much matter how that record is stored. Like I think a lot of people are really obsessed with what's the medium of that. But the important thing is that you have this record. You say, okay, great. In the future, I'm going to give you these props and that's going to allow us to exchange. And then what happens is, you know, 
you have this uh, this note, and you go to somebody else who's a carpenter, and you say, hey, I need some carpentry work. Can I give you some eggs? And they say, I don't really want any eggs right now. Say, okay, well, what about, you know, some crops, you know? Are you going to need some crops? I have this, you know, obligation here from Michael to do that. And you say, oh, yeah, I could do that. And we start swapping this IOU as opposed to just swapping the real thing. And this is like natural money as it just kind of evolves. And this system actually works pretty well if you're in a situation where you have a very small uh, community. What we would say is below the Dunbar number. So the Dunbar number is basically a uh, number of people, it's around 150 people, where everyone can know everyone. I think uh, uh, there's various different writers who've written about it. Anyway, so I'm like, okay, cool, that's great. Um, why does it work below this level? Um, for two reasons. Because first of all, the incentive of people to game the system is they're going to go and write up more IOUs than they can actually redeem, right? That would be a bad thing. Hmm. And in a small community, though, everybody knows each other out, and they're going to kind of notice if Michael's running around and writing up way too many IOUs. <laughs> um, and so, so that, that works. And then the second thing is there's a social contract where they're going to punish him by basically excluding him if he does that, right? They're going right. to say, hey, listen, you know, we're just not going to transact with you. And so because of that incentive system, it keeps itself in balance pretty well. You know, later on in the year, I redeem my IOU. Great. Give the grain. That's wonderful. And off we go. So. The problem with this is when we scale up, and one of the things I've been talking a lot about over the last year is that I think society has these twin underlying challenges, which are the uh, explosion of complexity and the explosion of scale. And these two things, our systems are not co designed for it. You know, we're kind of outdated machines. We as people just can't know everything about everything. You know, this we get lost in this complexity. So same idea here is, as you scale up, as you have a bigger community, maybe 10,000 people, and then you're trading between multiple communities, et cetera, you can't keep track of what everybody owes. And so mm -hmm. the incentives all breaks apart. So how did we solve that? Well, we created banks, right? And really a bank at the base level was some place that would keep a record of somebody's debts and their assets and be able to say, hey, this person's good for it. And then the bank would issue fungible notes that are kind of universal. And you would trust the bank instead of trusting the person. Now, of course, the incentive there is that at some point, banks realize, hey, hang on a minute. Most people aren't going to redeem as much of this as they need at any given time so we can produce extra notes. And, you know, that's not very good. So then banks have been the corrupt force. And so then what you do is you try and scale it up more and you say, okay, now we're going to add a regulatory layer and we're going to add a central bank that's going to back the other banks. and you know, all you're really doing is making the problem bigger when it eventually does break. So in the short term, okay, it looks more stable. You're like, hey, we went decades and we haven't had, you know, runs on the banks or something. It's like, yeah, but when the problem, like the incentives are still such that you have people who are going to abuse the system, you basically have a tragedy of the commons situation, which is where uh, you have some sort of kind of like a, a common good, in this case, money would be the common good. and Everybody has the incentive as an individual to abuse that system uh, because they benefit from it more than it uh, hurts them. For their, their, basically, what they take out of it is greater than the individual share that they lose, even though it's like, a con and as a result, everybody abuses it and it just gets worse and worse. But right now, it's a really big system, so it can go a long time before that breaking point. Mm. So you don't want that. Um, and so then the question is, okay, well, you know, what, what do we do about that? And, you know, the, the conventional alternative view is kind of Austrian economics. It's hard, this idea of hard money, scarce supply, so that somebody can't produce it, et cetera. And that has certain advantages to it. Um, you know, if you're in a situation where, I was talking to somebody yesterday about this, if you're forced to uh, tax in order to get resources rather than spend debt, your equation about what things are costing is very different. Right? Wait, like can, sometimes you, people, can, can you say that again? If you're forced to... Uh, okay, so say you're the government and you want to spend money and you can't spend money you don't have. You have to actually tax people for it in order to spend it, right? Mm. If you're in that situation, the equation of accountability and visibility changes very dramatically because let's think that, okay, like sometimes people will tell me, hey, they're not getting good value for 
their money when they're paying taxes. And there's a certain perspective on that. But another perspective is, well, actually, they're running a massive deficit. So you're actually getting more than you pay for in this case, um, although the allocation of resources is really bad. And so when you think about it from that standpoint, you know, what's happening is that they're kind of hiding what it's really costing in the form of, hey, we just you know, produce more money. No big deal. And, you know, <laughs> right. this, 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 like this is literally what happens. Imagine if, you know, so in the U.S., they have, I don't know, like a $6 trillion deficit or something in the past year. Yeah. This is a massive increase. It's basically double the tax revenues they collected. So basically, you can say, hey, in order to spend that much, you would have had to tax all the population double. Now, how would people behave differently towards their politicians and what they're willing to approve if they had to actually pay for it today? They would behave very differently, right? But you can create this distortion. Um, so that's, that's not good. Now, the problem with something like gold uh, is that I mean, there's a few different problems with it. But the main problem when you think about it as a system, and I think a lot of people who think about money think of it as a thing. And that's okay. Um, but I think it's more useful to think of it as a system. Oh, definitely. Kind of, I agree. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, and like, so if you think about it from that standpoint, you're like, well, what's the purpose of this system? And I like to think of it as the purpose of the system is to uh, allocate resources as productively as possible in as efficient way as possible. It's kind of like your ideal of money. In other words, it, you know, what is money doing? Well, it's communicating price information and price information is telling you what's valuable by the market. And therefore you should allocate resources in that direction. That's the theory. The problem is when you have a scarce or monopolized supply of money, when things go into a downturn, the market can't clear. What does this mean that the market can't clear? Well, let's say that there's two people who are both unemployed. And they actually have value they can provide to each other, but they have no money. Well, they actually can't transact. And so a lot of resources are latent. And we don't want that. We want to basically optimize the system so that people are being productive and producing things and adding value to each other. And you're not, you're not restricted by, hey, do I have this, you know, this third party thing that is a scarce supply that I now have to go find somebody and get it? And the value of that just went up because there's a scarcity throughout the system. So therefore, it becomes harder for me to get the thing that I most need to transact at the time I most need it to transact. That's a bad incentive. So what then is the solution? Well, in my opinion, the solution is blockchain has enabled us to go back to the very initial stage where we started, which was, hey, you can write an IOU to, uh, an IOU to me. And... We can keep track. We can know transparently what everybody has as obligations and assets and with their, their credit worthy. And I don't have to trust somebody. And I don't have to trust a middleman who's going to distort it. So how would I do this? Uh, I think that you should have what's called money by agreement. How does money by agreement work? Every Instead of having a monopolized money supply, you have a decentralized money supply, meaning that in a sense, Anyone can create the money. Uh, they create the money through a transaction where somebody else agrees to accept it. And it's just a, mm. a creation I love of that. debt. I love that, yeah. yeah. And, and the incentive is, like, let's just imagine that you come to me and you say, hey, Michael, you know, I don't have something right now. I'll give it to you in the future. You know, will you accept X? And it becomes, it's created the moment that I say, yes, Shannon, I'm willing to accept that. Now, the incentive for me is that if you're going to come to me and say, I'm going to give you a billion dollars. You might say, well, why? what's going to prevent somebody from doing that? It's like, well, if it keeps track of your creditworthiness and the value of the money is based on your creditworthiness, then I will never be able to reset, uh, spend that money because it will be attached to you. And when I get this billion dollars, the credit rating thing will say, there's no chance, Shannon, and you're ever repaying this. And so everybody else is going to be like, why would I accept those Shannon dollars when you know she's mm -hmm. not going to repay? So. It's like self-regulating where I say, okay, you know, I'm willing to accept this much from you. There's all kinds of interesting consequences of like how this works. And uh, so I think you have that. And then underneath that, you need a layer of tokenization. And uh, because here's the thing. There's did this you say, narrative. Did you say tokenization? Tokenization, yeah. Yep, okay. Um, cool. and, and the reason for that is because 
there's this narrative that I was told years ago, which is, hey, they print the money and they charge you interest on the money, but they don't print the money for the interest. So how can you ever repay the debt? It's a, a perpetually not mm. able to be repaid thing. Yeah. This is the this is the story. The the fallacy of that is that debt should be repaid with interest, or sorry, with money. That should kind of shouldn't be repaid with money. Because money should just be an information communicator about real goods and services. And mm. so when I in this system, if I create this IOU, what it's repaid with is actually fulfilling with the real goods and services. You know, right. it's like, right. hey, I'm promising you this. So when I do that, boom, the money vanishes, you know, it's not in existence anymore. And therefore, you know, the debt has been repaid and off we go. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. You know, you can do that. But then we can ask the question of what if you have no money? And it's like, well, what you do is you take a real good and service and you tokenize it and uh, you fractionalize that real good and service, the tokenization. And you say, hey, you know, uh, maybe I don't have money. Maybe I don't have, I don't want to give you the credit or I don't have the credit or whatever. Will you accept, you know, a small piece of my house, of my car, or whatever? And this tokenization, that becomes like the base layer. Of everything is like the real the tokenization of real goods and services. And I think this is a very I think this is a very interesting idea because it also puts the responsibility of the trader, of the person accepting the trade or offering the trade. They really have to look at what stuff is worth to them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Which I think at yeah, this it, point a lot of people are pretty lost on what I actually value in their lives. Totally. Totally. Yeah. So so this is like I mean, a brief explanation of what I consider to be like this idea of money by agreement. And it would be like totally decentralized. And I like it because if you look at cryptocurrency, I think there's this problem where uh, government tries to control on and off ramps and on and off ramps becomes vulnerability. And I always thought like in order for a system of digital currency that's like decentralized, et cetera, to really work, you need people to be able to get that money without previously having money. And why shouldn't you be able to go and provide a service if you're somebody in Africa and get some digital currency from it, right? Like, why does it have to be that, hey, I have to find somebody who already has Bitcoin and I have to trade that for them? It's like, why Why is the way that it comes about only through mining or something, right? And mining is not successful. So this allows that anybody anywhere could transact just by, hey, we can agree between ourselves that you have value and I'm willing to compensate you for that value in the future and we can start trading and working and growing from there. What is true leadership? Discover and take a deep dive into some of the most amazing resources for true leadership in the universe. Visit shannon-ohara.com backslash leadership to discover all and more. Uh, so have you been able to implement or institute any of this in your own life? Uh, what do you mean by that? Like this is, you know, uh, I think a technology that a person would have to build. So uh, I, nice. what, yeah. So what I mean is like implementing the theory of it, not necessarily the tech, not exactly the story you just told about the blockchain and the Bitcoin and the person in Africa, but this mm-hmm. um, agreed upon money. Mm. I mean, It's a good question. I mean, I think that we all do, like, it's kind of natural, right? It's like, we all do this to some extent, right? Between each other. We just don't have a system of keeping track of that information in a way that is divisible and fungible and immutable, I guess is what you would call it. I know. I think a lot about, yeah, I mean, I think a lot about what, how we would, how how differently we would function without money, which I actually think is, uh, Uh, unrealistic unrealistic based on the size of the world and the population as you or more state as you previously stated about a hundred or less people you can basically self-regulate but when you get bigger than that then you get other stuff going on yeah 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 you have these like different things that you have to uh have to deal with so yeah that's like just a different uh uh different idea yeah, I mean, so I love I love that you're thinking about it and I love that you've actually gone through the steps of looking at like how could this work. Um mm-hmm. 
And it, I mean, it would probably work just as well, if not better. I, it was really interesting to look at part of what you were talking about, about sort of the agreed upon, like you and I make an agreement to trade something that I, I sort of love it in the way of there is no fallback. Like you can't check out of the situation because you're not going to have um, like a backup. Like there's not a regulatory board who's going to protect you if, you know, there is no there is the consequence is that if if this doesn't work, you have to be mm, responsible, I think is yeah. maybe uh, which which then really like encourages away from debting and I guess it encourages awareness more than anything else. Yeah, like I think it's so important to have personal accountability, right? And I, I think that I took a personal development course years ago and there was like a huge thing on personal accountability. And one of the things they pointed out was accountability is always personal. Like you can't have group accountability. It doesn't work <laughs> that way, you know? It's like, it's we personal. would love it if that was possible, but it's just not. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, so personal accountability is so important. And if you remove the personal accountability from the system, then the system is, you know, it's just very predictable that over time it's going to break. Might, might be able to kick the can down the road a long ways, but that's going to happen. And it's like people who are going to be personally accountable. I mean, you know, this and just, you know, how we go out and be digital nomads and travel the world and things like this. It's just when you take accountability for yourself and you start thinking in that way, like your whole life changes. Everything just opens up to you. And, you know, we have a system today that's like very victim culture, right? really there's a big payoff to being a victim that's terrible that's really really bad yeah yeah i mean even just staying complacent in the i guess like the society and the taxation system that you're born into um Mm -hmm. i've had i work with a lot of people and i work with quite a lot of like out of the box thinking ambitious people and i remember them asking me like, Hey, so like, what do I do about this? And I was like, wow, well, you've got to completely reframe your entire life. Like you've got to completely, <laughs> you know, and I, and I sort of like, do you, is, do you want to go that far? Um, yeah. it, I sort of made these really big choices in my life, but I looked around and I realized I'd done them completely alone, which I thought was really yeah. interesting because I, mm-hmm. I really don't actually know anybody personally who's made this, these big of choices and changes on paper. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And, it, and you know, like, when, when you do that, you kind of, like, you grow your capacity, you know? Like, it's, it's actually really good for you as a person each time you go through this. And, like, the next time, and then, by proxy, that's good for us as a society. And, you know, so, yeah, I think that's... You said, you said something that I thought was super interesting in one of your videos, and I can't remember which it was, but it was on YouTube, and you were talking about, oh, I think you were talking about America, and... Oh, if I remember the title of the video, that would make this much more impactful. But essentially, you were talking about some, uh, some. Ta- I think it was a, like a taxation policy that was changing, and how it was basically driving sort of innovative, forward thinkers out of the country. And I looked at oh, that, yeah. and I was like, "That's exactly what happened to me." I went, "I'm not yep. staying here for this." And you made yep. this. You made this indication of of what a sort of a national policy change like that does to the population because the population starts losing its yeah. sort of visionaries and its big achievers. And it's, um, oh, it's such an interesting, yeah, it's just an interest. Yeah. So I, I wonder if I, I don't, you don't have to answer this question and I could totally edit this part out, but I sort of am really curious if you'd be interested in talking about some of the things like the changes that you've made, um, some of the offshore uh, perspectives that you have, ways and w- things that you've set up. And one of the things you talk about a lot in your videos, which I love, is you say, if it works for you, like if this way mm-hmm. of doing this works for you, because not yep. one like uh, plan There's works no one for everybody. Itself. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, like the most common thing I hear from people is they call and they're like, hey, you know, what should I, or what's the best this? I think there is no best this. It's, you know, what's best for you? So, yeah. 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 Um, so things that I've kind of done in my own life. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think a few different things. So first of all, you know, I made the choice to, and I think like the most basic level of things that people can do is start traveling. You know, I have people who will call me up sometimes and say, Hey, you know, I'm thinking of moving to this country. And I'm like, have you been there? I'm like, no, like, no, maybe, maybe go. 
just like go check it out. Like, see that there's a different way that the world is. So, you know, my decision to travel a lot, I think, is a big deal. And then the next thing that goes along with that is have friends all over the world. I think it's just such a, my wife was commenting on this yesterday. She said she thought that being worldly, you know, traveling and meeting people from different parts of the world and experiencing different cultures, et cetera, is like one of the most underrated things that they don't teach you in school. You know, it's like got such a, such a big thing. So, you know, this is like, you know, it might seem like a little thing, but I think it's kind of like the base layer of almost everything. Right. And so that, that was the first thing. Um, then I think the second thing for me was hiring people overseas. You know, I remember when I was, you know, a pretty early stage entrepreneur and I didn't have much money and I go to see somebody in Canada where I'm from and it's like, Oh, it's $5,000 to build a basic website. I'm like, wow, that's like, you know, a lot of money to me at the time. And then you discover, Oh, Hey, you know, there's this thing called Upwork and you can hire some person in some other country and they'll do it for you for $500. And you know, now it's, you know, there's all kinds of, this was years ago. So now it's much cheaper and you know, there's all sorts of fancy tools you can use, et cetera. But uh, hiring people abroad was a big thing for me. And to this day is a big thing for me. Like most of the people who work for me work in, I guess, Eastern Europe or Africa. And, you know, it's great. You know, I think that it's a wonderful thing to be able to hire people in other countries and tap into different skill sets and get, you know, kind of more value out of that. And that just creates a lot more possibilities for you than you would have if you were restricted to the pool of mm -hmm. people where you're from. So there's that. Uh, then, you know, I moved overseas, right? And so, you know, there's lots of different reasons for that. Uh, but going and living in another country uh, does a bunch of different things. So first of all, you know, lowers your tax rates. That's a great thing. Suddenly Depending on where you move, because I made a true, mistake. True. When I, I moved to Australia <laughs> once and I was like, what the crap is this? I was like, true, I was true. jumping out of the frying pan. I totally jumped into the fire. I was like, whoa, wake up call. This is true. This is true. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, yes, that uh, that is definitely true. Um, so yeah, so, so the point is, you can have that possibility. There's a possibility. For me, it was much better. Um, and so, so you go to a different well, part of the world. You moved, so you, but you moved to Bulgaria, is that correct? Correct, yeah. yeah. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about why you chose Bulgaria? Um, yeah, there was, there was a combination of things. So I, you know, my position, again, was quite different than a lot of people's. Um, one of them was I met the woman who became my wife, and she was I met her in Serbia. Uh, she was from Montenegro, and so she couldn't move to a bunch of different places. Mm, and mm. so we, just, we basically made a decision that, okay, if we want to be together, we need to go someplace where we can both fairly easily have residency. And then I threw the layer on that of, okay, it also has to be good for business. Mm. And so, you know, I basically gave her a set of options, and that was one of them. And at the time, the relationship was kind of new and she thought to herself, well, this is close to my home. If something goes wrong, I can right. so, <laughs> so, so that there was an element of that. Um, other things that were like very practical about it were I knew about uh, kind of kind of the costs there. So costs were a big thing. There's two parts to the costs. One was because we were traveling a lot, we thought, well, if we have a place in, I don't know, someplace that has expensive rent, let's say you're like in London and you're trying to keep a flat while you're traveling the world, it's going to be like, $5,000 a month for a flat that you're not using half the year right. or something. This seems right. terrible, right? Whereas if I'm in Bulgaria, I can have a nice apartment and I can keep it empty six months a year and it costs me $1,000 a month. And who cares, right? right. So there, there was a practicality there in just like, hey, low cost of living uh, is nice. Uh, then I wanted to be able to hire people in that part of the world. And it turns out that you know, there's a lot of reasons why it's a fairly decent place to hire hire people. So that was useful. And then the taxes were good. And then it's like a really convenient place. Like you can walk most places. It's really well connected by air. Uh, the, the infrastructure in terms of like internet and cell phone coverage, all this stuff worked really well. And so for me at the time, it made uh, made a lot of sense. I have residency in Dubai now, so spend more time there. But uh, but for oh, a number of years, that was. Yeah. Can you can you talk a little bit more about Dubai and why you did that? Yeah. Um, so basically, I actually wanted to go to Malaysia. That was the yeah. I spent quite a bit of time in Malaysia, and I really like Malaysia. But then, and I was planning on moving there before COVID. But then, because COVID <laughs> came around, you know, right? It uh, and, and like the they just locked everything up, and the government went mad. 
And so it's not really very friendly to foreigners at this point in time. I hope they change it because I really think it's a wonderful country. And anyway, so I started doing this thought experiment in my head. And I said, okay, what are the places in the world that I think with a high degree of probability are going to be dramatically better 10 years from now? Mm. I need to start thinking like, okay, what countries would those be? And the corollary of it is I can go and I can look historically, you know, what places are dramatically better today than they were 10 years ago. And if I look at some place like France, it's not clear to me that it's better. You know, I'm like, <laughs> is it better? <laughs> France. Okay, yeah, right. Yeah. So, so, you know, it actually, to me anyway, seemed like a pretty small list. And the one place that I thought it really seemed like is that every time I visit Dubai, and I've visited Dubai basically every year for a number of years, it's better. It's better every time. And you just have like really smart people who run this country who understand what their failings are. It's not perfect. No place is perfect. But they're working on improving it. And even like they came up with this Vision 2040 thing in, uh, I guess it was the spring, where they said they want Dubai to be the best city in the world to live in by 2040. And I kind of think I'm like, shouldn't this be the goal of like every city? What is happening here? <laughs> but they actually are setting the vision right. and actually right. going and doing something about it. Right. I think they'll probably succeed. Like, uh, it was about six years ago or something, they decided they wanted the UAE passport to be a top five passport within five years. Well, in one year, they added 19 countries visa free. Mm. Nobody does this. Nobody. Mm. Like, maybe you add two, maybe you add three, and you're like, you're doing good. 19 countries in a single year. Like, they know how to do these things, they know how to execute, et cetera. And so then you can start just looking and you can say, okay, well, like, what have you got today? You know, is it, what, what's it looking like today? I'm like, well, it's the only world-class zero-tax city in the world. Like every other place that you can go that has no taxes is a little island or, mm, you know, a chicken some coop. small. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, whereas here, it's like you have pretty much everything you want in Dubai. I and mean, it's a city of almost 4 million people. It has so many like restaurants and things to do and all this kind of stuff. It's one of the best connected cities in the world. Like you have three major airlines with three major airports. You know, you can go practically anywhere in a direct flight. Um, and then a great, you can see. Go ahead. Well, it's a, it's a great example of a nation that is attracting people yes, exactly. who are exactly. interested in the future. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Like, you know, they just had <laughs> two, two things. So first of all, I mean, the number of my clients who've been moving to Dubai in the last year is like, I've never seen this before. There's a lot of people who are going there. And that's great because then you build a local community. And I think the community is super important. Like if I think about the best thing that I like about Bulgaria, when people ask me, what's Bulgaria like, et cetera, is I built a really good community of people who I love, who are just amazing. And, you know, that's a huge, huge important thing. And so when you've got really cool people going to live in a place, that's awesome. You're building this. It's a great thing. And you, you kind of think of this contrast, like, I saw an article a client of mine sent me. He's uh, uh, partially Australian. He's got a bunch of citizenships. Um, he sent it, to, I think, yesterday or the day before or something. And it was like, uh, Australia is trying to attract uh, high skill tech workers. And the way that they're doing it is creating a bright line test for whether they're going to tax you or not. And it's like this draconian set of rules. Like, hey, so long as you don't spend more than 45 days in the country, we're not going to tax you. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You're going to try and attract high skill people with this like yeah hey guys I mean, don't get me started check. about us. Oh, australia is so archaic it's nuts but it's like just it this really insane is. insane place yeah i yeah i could tell a million stories about australia but i don't want to i don't want to depress myself um yeah. so okay so so with the dubai residence residency AEU, mm -hmm. res, a e a e u a e u a e u e thank you my dyslexia kicked in right there um, so is that residency something that you're looking to mature into citizenship what's the what what do you actually get out of that residency well so two things so historically it's been impossible basically to get uae citizenship um, unfortunately and like you know i work with we do lots of citizenship by investment work so we help and so I worked with some people in UAE on that specifically. And last time I was there, I went for dinner with uh, some people from one of these companies. And the guy was from Spain, been in the business for a lot of years. 
And he was like, man, if I could give up my Spanish citizenship and get UAE citizenship instead, I would do it in a heartbeat. Like, I would love that. Um, so it's a great citizenship. They just announced for the first time in 20, uh, the end of 2020 or the beginning of 2021 that they will allow foreigners to get UAE citizenship. So hmm. they haven't really said what, like, there isn't a specific way that you can get it. They've given it out to select people so far. Um, but I would love to get UAE citizenship. I think it's an amazing passport. It's one of the best in terms of like the reach. Like, for example, it's one of the very few that allows you to have visa free access to both Russia and China. Almost no passports. <laughs> wow. Um, That's actually yeah. wow. So it's like the only country that you can't go to that you would want to go to, I would say, on a UAE passport is the US. Um, oh, what a, so, what a surprise. What a, what a surprise. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, so, so that would be cool. But for me, it's more about actually living there, you know, is uh, I, I want to spend a bunch of the year there. I think that it's a really good place. I think that, you know, places are good for various different things. And this is a good place to build. If you're in a position where you want to build and I'm kind of in a building phase of my life, uh, I think it's a great place to be. And so, you know, um, it, hopefully it would lead to some citizenship. But if it doesn't, you know, I'm choosing it not saying, hey, I'm doing it because of citizenship or something. I'm choosing it because I think for my wife and I at this stage of our lives, it's a good place to be. And, uh, you know, we're going to base ourselves there a lot of the year. I mean, we're pretty mobile people. And, uh, you know, that will be uh, that. Will be that. Oh, I love that way of looking at it. And it's really refreshing. And I love listening to you. And I really appreciate that you're putting this out into the world. Um, I really encourage people to go browse through your library of YouTube videos, because like the topics you cover are so wide ranging. And like, really, like the one thing I needed to do, which was deal with what am I going to do about the EU? I was going around and around and around about that for like, I would say like I was dabbling for like a year and a half and like educating myself about a bunch of different stuff and da, 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 and like really trying to commit to a choice. And then yeah. when Brexit finally happens, I was like, okay, now I really do need to commit to a choice. And <laughs> yeah, that was it. You were able to fulfill that, that one very logistical specific need, like in a way that I could have never expected. And, and I love that you asked me a series of questions. You were like, well, what's, I kept telling you like my priority is ease. <laughs> And then you came, yeah. you heard me and you came back and you went, well, if it's really easier after you should do this. And I went, yeah, let's do that. Like, that's exactly what I want. Cause to be perfectly honest, like a lot of the other golden visas and um, other ways I could have possessed an EU citizenship. Like my husband's German, but getting a German citizenship is like incredible. I mean, you've got to be so committed to Germany and then you have to like renounce all your other citizenships. And I'm just like, I can't, I can't, I can't. And so when, and so it, a lot of, a lot of the other EU, poss like there is a lot of other possibilities, but it's work and it takes time and money and da, da, da. And you're like, well, here's this other way, <laughs> you know, it yeah. costs more money, but it's fast and it's relatively easy. So I yeah. really appreciate that you have like all these different possible, like access to a lot of different information. Yep. I think it's yeah, like I mean, fascinating. I, please. I, I kind of, I kind of try and travel the world and meet different people and build different knowledge and my view is that everything is a tool you know and so i want a larger set of tools to help people with and it's like okay uh sometimes you know you're just you're in a situation it's like you want to be able to have that resource that helps you to do this better it's kind of like being in a kitchen and you're cooking and you're like hey you know well right now it'd be really useful to have a uh i don't know like a egg poacher you know and uh Right. Hey, we have that. That's perfect. We can, you know, make this happen here. Makes it well, make much easier. It's a very interesting skill set and it's a very interesting like field of interest. Um, it's something that I still I need somebody like you because I get very intimidated by or I actually probably probably meet comparatively I'm not very intimidated, but it is it can be <laughs> overwhelming and it it can just be weird, you know. Um and, and it's hard, you know, like I remember, so prior to doing this business, uh, I had a company that we were, uh, it was like bringing products from China and some of them around uh, North America. And I remember my business partner and I were talking, we were thinking about doing some tax structuring and optimization and things like this. And so I told him what this was going to cost. And he was like, no, oh, it's pretty expensive. You know, like, can we just do it ourselves? And at the time I didn't know, I was like, I don't know. Um, and then after I got into this business, <laughs> And I learned it and stuff. I remember like 
spending a month reading tax treaties. And I called him <laughs> and I was like, it's worth it. Trust me. Like the amount of work you have to do to figure it out yourself, like it is just worth it to pay somebody because you just don't know what you don't know. And it's like really painful learning. You know? <laughs> Oh my God. I love that. I spent a month reading tax treaties. I mean, yeah, it's, that's exactly right. So I appreciate that you actually have a huge amount of information and you're connected to a whole network of people who actually have very target specific knowledge. Um, so yeah. anything else you want to add before we finish? I mean, I think that's, that's good. I hope that people, uh, people got some value and, you know, learned, uh, learned some things and I would love to hear from, I, I always think that, you know, if people like the things that I have, you know, I appreciate them sharing it. And then on the flip side, if they, you know, disagree, like I want to hear why. And so uh, if people have feedback. That's always, always appreciated. And uh, yeah, try and, try and always improve. Yeah, brilliant. And uh, like I said earlier, all of Michael's resources will be linked in the show notes for this episode. So if you guys like, please like learn, explore, see what else is possible. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time. I love this conversation and I appreciate that there's people like you out there in the world doing and thinking differently. Awesome. Well, it was a pleasure to be here and to talk to you and I'm excited to talk more in the future. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you for listening to this show. My target is to make consciousness easy to find and choose. So if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a five-star review on iTunes and share this with somebody who you know who might be looking for more consciousness in their life. You can visit me on shannon-ohara.com or talktotheentities.com. And to learn more about the amazing tools of Access Consciousness, you can visit accessconsciousness.com and be sure to subscribe to the podcast. Thank you.